So, um, do the global health rights people, are, are there any left? Do you want to stand up and say hello? Yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody else, somebody else? No, no, no. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. And also, are the TY people here? Yeah, we had a group of TY people. Transition year people from one of the schools, and they're also volunteering. Anyway, sorry, I know you want to get home. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is about five minutes of kind of impressions from the two days. And these impressions are partly mine, partly the global health rights people impressions, and also just things we've heard around. So do forgive me if I miss your presentation out. Secondly, do forgive me if I miss anything really important out, although I must make a... I am going to mention fecal sludge management because that's a completely new phrase I'd never heard of until literally three hours ago. Um, so that's been interesting. Uh, but this is just some of the key things that seem to have come out this week uh, from, from the sessions. How do you advance on this? Oh, yeah, okay. So what I'm going to talk about in the next five minutes are, firstly, what we've done, obviously. Secondly, is that some of the themes that I think seem to have emerged. So I, I've seen these five themes. You may have seen other themes coming out, and that's fine. But this is the way I've arranged, um, arranged this. And lastly, finish some, some take-home messages to take, take away from certainly the impressions that we've got from the, from the conference that's been going on. So what have we done? We've had plenaries, parallel sessions, and soapbox sessions, which is another new thing. And they worked really well, didn't they, the soapbox sessions, do you think? It was great. Uh, it was great, yeah, yeah, yeah. We had discussions, networking, and wine, um, in probably in the right order health-wise, but personally, maybe it would have been wine networking discussions. Uh, meeting for students to explore career options. Many students got up at 8 o'clock this morning to go to some um, discussions about global health career pathways, which is a really good, innovative approach, including, um, including an exercise on how to solve a global health problem, which I thought was quite interesting. Uh, we had the launch of the IFGH strategy last night. We heard details of Irish AIDS upcoming um, development policy. And today we also had a Women in Global Health in Ireland open forum. So it's been a full few days. It feels like a few days, but it's literally about, what, eight hours or something? <laughs> maybe more, maybe 10 hours. But anyway, it's been, it's been a good time. It's been a good time. And, oh, it's okay, thank you, that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. And one of the TY people got this quote from a participant they um, ganged up in, on in the corridor, I think. So they asked the question, what do you think of the conference? So uh, the response was, I was looking to meet other people, interested in global health, to learn, get new ideas, take out time from my normal work, and I've managed to do all these things. So if that one evaluation can be used that would, be, um, that would be good, but we hope you fill in the evaluation afterwards as well. But I thought it was useful to include, because actually we tend to get so swamped in all the information, but at the end of the day, it's a great opportunity to meet colleagues, not be stuck at work, and just to find out what else is going on in our work. So that's, uh, so that's really good. So the first thing I just want to pick up is that problems aren't always international. One of the big themes that's come up this, these, this week, I keep saying this week, these two one and a half days, is that there are also problems in Ireland and therefore a lot of the work we do overseas can be reflected back in Ireland. So some of the things that we've heard about this week are issues around uh, problems with Irish, the Irish health system, um, uh, which is expensive and to quote somebody, it's a poor system for poor people. Uh, and we also heard about the large private health sector in Ireland, which is obviously causes problems when you're trying to deliver unified service. And we need, need to do at home what we advocate for abroad. Now, this isn't unique to Ireland. It's the same in the UK, where I'm based as well, in many ways. But this was something that came up in these two days, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, there is going to be an impact on Ireland of cl climate change, which we talked about this morning. This will be slow to emerge, but it does require some quite robust responses, for example, in agriculture and transportation uh, and in community level kind of um, interventions to make sure that Ireland isn't caught out when it comes to climate change. Um, and for climate change, because for change, climate change, because it's so political, there has to be strong advocacy from the community level. And this is something that keeps being flagged up throughout all the presentations we've had, the need for a strong community and good advocates, because they can often produce the most change. Second theme, it's about the people. Often in our work, and I class myself in this as well, we do forget there are actually people at the end of all the stuff we're doing. So what are the issues facing people? Well, there is a need to empower people to change. 
uh, for themselves, not try and do things for them. That's an old idea in development, but it's still very pertinent, I think. And people are often ready to make the right choice, but the system just needs to enable them to do that. And we heard uh, the examples from Malawi and UHC uh, about that uh, yesterday. Intervi intervention needs to target with the furthest behind first. That was a quote we had. And also, we do now have a chance to uh, work for a system where no one is left behind. We do have that opportunity it, there is the potential to make great change over the next few years. It's just actually achieving that. Uh, using a rights-based approach, that's been something that's underpinned things coming up this week, and ensuring that global health links with human rights and promotes equal opportunities, respect and inclusivity, which was illustrated just in the last plenary about disabilities and the need to include people with disabilities in processes. Because I know when I... When I did the MSC here 10 years ago with somebody who was working on that because she was very concerned that this is something that tends to get missed off the radar when we uh, look at development programs. Um, so yeah, there is a need to include people's disabilities and there's a quote from Israel Balogan who was speaking just before, thank you. When you exclude one, you cannot imagine the extent of harm to health. Disabilities inclusion is a basic human right, this human right thing again, which is popping up, don't leave anyone behind. And I did have a last bullet point living day to day. Throughout all the last day and a half, all the presentations, there's been examples of just people living day to day. So we had a presentation yesterday about women finding it difficult to maintain uh, menstrual hygiene management. Is that the official phrase? That's another phrase I learned alongside faecal sludge management. Um, so there are, the, there are people at the end of the processes we're trying to uh, enable. So how do, we, how do we consider them? The next major theme is integration and coherence. And um, we heard about the need to avoid silos and the way that there are across all the SDGs, and that's something I haven't mentioned yet, but of course this, the SDGs are underpinning this conference, is um, there is a lot of cross-cutting, uh, there are a lot of cross-cutting issues. For example, in environmental health, and now I talked about this yesterday, what's good for climate it is always good for health. And therefore, even though a lot of my, well, my work and your work probably as well, is in SDG 3. There are so many cross-cutting elements and we can't think really about development in these silos anymore. It's got to be spread across all the goals we're trying to achieve. And the impacts of SDGs on health, and I gave this example that, it's an obvious example, it's something that came to mind about 15 minutes ago as I was typing up in the corner, that, um, for example, improved family planning leads to less children less mouths to feed, less consumption, and therefore less risk to nutrition. Now, it's an obvious thing. In any sense, it's, it's plain to see. But this kind of joined up thinking, I think, is important to take on from this, um, this conference. And the third point here is fragile and conflict solutions. How do you respond in those situations? And we had some amazing presentations this morning during the plenary about EMT and other interventions in fragile situations, but also their place in the overall nexus. Now, that's a word that not everybody likes, but I think it's a nice word. So this kind of crossover of humanitarian and development issues in a nexus. How do we respond in these kind of situations? What are the barriers? Um, well, they've been obvious this week, I think. Uh, P uh, the great quote from uh, Maureen O'Sullivan last night, uh, people tend to do conflict better than collaboration, which is brilliant. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Stigma is still around, a lot of stigma, uh, which doesn't go away. We heard about the self-stigma toolkit. We heard yesterday from Breda about condom stigma, which again, I haven't heard of that phrase, but it's obvious the people in some countries, Ireland being one, but many other countries, just can't talk about stigma. Uh, sorry, can't talk about condoms because it's so stigmatized. And of course, stigmas prevent, uh, stigmas, yeah. condoms prevent HIV as well as STDs and, oh, pregnancies as well. Who'd have thought? But, you know, I've, I've, spoke, I've taught many students who say, oh, I'm okay, I don't use a condom, but I'm on the pill, so it's okay. You know, well, yeah, but, you know, whatever. Um, the growing challenge of uh, NCDs uh, that came up and also continuing lack of skills to support uh, healthcare workers and how to return them in their country. That was popping up uh, quite regularly. And also, just before this session in the plenary, problems with the lack of r robust evidence in some of the work that we do. Man much of the stuff we do instinctively feels right, but do we really know that's the best option of the possible options? Um, 
So that's important not to forget. And I did skip one um, bullet point, uh, mobile populations. There's one example given from Sudan, but uh, this is a big issue, obviously, across the whole of Europe. How do you support people who one day are in one country, then relocate to another country, then relocate to another country? How do you keep track of all the public health challenges in those populations? We had some solutions presented, which was nice. We had data collection tool solutions. Um, I heard last night or yesterday about some capacity building for how to do gender analyses at country level and also uh, implementation research to measure the, measure the performance of community midwives in Sudan. Uh, we heard about solutions to public health challenges in rural Uganda, for example, uh, stockouts and staff absenteeism in a rural health community. How, how do you deal with those issues? We heard about the need for clarity around advocacy. If we do want a government to do something, what's the messaging? And we heard the example from Malawi about UHC, which is very clear now what is needed. So can the community push to get that achieved? We heard a lot about resilience and the need to consider that many problems just keep popping up. The old continuum model of a problem, an intervention, then it sorts itself out. It's gone, it has gone in many places now. You have a problem, an intervention, then the problem recurs, or a similar problem, then a similar problem again, then another intervention. And this could go on for years. So how, how do we build that into our programming? We had some innovations like e-health for young people and mental health uh, issues, and also the toolkit for self-stigma, and also the collaboration issue again, and David Weekly had this nice quote, which I've heard before, but it's nice. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So final take-home messages then to finish. What, what did we think were the most important things to take away? Firstly, issues are often universal because stigma cross-cuts or the SDGs cross-cuts. So are there better ways, A, to learn from the past and B, to transfer between uh, sectors and contexts? Secondly, big words this, uh, these last two days, community engagement and inclusivity, the importance of community in its broadest sense, being involved in policy and planning. Nothing for me without me, I think I used that before, but certainly the HIV sector that had a huge impact on building up a strong, robust community response to HIV, and why can't that be used in other contexts as well? Thirdly, facilitating communities so they can do it themselves, empowerment is fine, but we, only, we can only really do that when we find out what they think they need, what they want, and what we can provide them in achieving. So it's a kind of participatory approach. Fourth, word, fourth point is harmonization. Uh, global health is often fragmented, scattered between N NGOs, NGOs, communities, governments, uh, uh, and other people. Um, so how can we how do we build more harmony between all these people working on the ground in certain places? Fifthly, sustainability, big issue. We have talked some about this week, the, these last two days, not a huge amount, but this quote um, I think uh, illustrates that sustainability and the issues around it aren't going to go away. They're going to get worse in some ways, A, because funding streams are changing across the world. Secondly, civil society spaces are shrinking, particularly heavily marginalised and punitively treated populations like HIV drug users um, and gay men, lesbians. And therefore, how do you build in programmes that are sustainable within those contexts? It's still a challenge, it's, and it's always been a challenge, but we shouldn't let it fall off the radar. And lastly, uh, getting more out of less, funds globally are shrinking, so how can we build on what's there already? So we've got something in place, so how can we make that stronger? And we did hear of some ideas this in the last two days about something is there so a tool a tool has been used to evaluate it and then you go in and strengthen it rather than doing something completely new then just parachuting it in to sort out the problem which could have been solved simply with what you had there already.